How to shoot dark and moody boudoir. This is my jam, and I'm going to share all the things with you right now, because I am so stoked that you are here to learn how to shoot dark and moody. There's basically two kinds of boudoir lighting. The most popular option is the light and airy, where there's just tons of light everywhere, and, you know, white sheets, and things tend to be, like, overexposed, but, like, could be in a good way. And then there's the dark and moody side, like, the totally opposite end of that spectrum. And pros and cons to both. Most photographers get into to the light and airy look because it's the easiest. I mean, it's like really easy. It's pretty gosh darn hard to mess that up. And the dark and moody is really, really tough. Tough to get right. Anyone can underexpose photos, but to actually shoot this sort of style takes a little bit of work and I'm gonna help fast track that for you. So who the heck am I? My name is Mike Lloyd and I am a professional boudoir photographer. I've been doing it since 2015, shooting professionally since 2010. And this is the only way that I shoot boudoir. I love doing the dark and moody look. I did my very first shoot like this because the shoot was in an empty white room. Well, there was a bed. I'm, I'm like motioning to my bed as if that, you know, the bed in my studio as if that was the bed. It was not the bed. The bed in the room was the only thing in the room. White walls all around on a hardwood floor. So I'm like, what the F am I going to do in a giant basically empty white room. I don't know. It was my very first one. I don't even know what I was doing, but it was like a friend had asked me to do the thing. So here I was. So I'm like, well, I got a softbox and I can put this grid on it and just light her. And then you won't even see that there's an empty room behind her if I expose for that. And so that's what I did. And that became my signature style. And it's cool because I love it. And because it's so challenging for most photographers to pick up, uh, but not you, because you're learning the right way in the right place the first time. So few people do it. And it's one of my competitive advantages. It also was, you know, like what got me into teaching because everyone wanted to know what I do. And aside from the business, like my lighting style, my posing is pretty unique. So uh, that's what got me speaking at conferences and, you know, the podcast and judging print competitions and doing all these things. So I'm grateful that that's what I enjoy and that other people enjoy it also. I also enjoy this mint tea. This episode is not brought to you by Tazo, although again, if they wanted to sponsor me, that would be wonderful. Allergies have been kicking my butt, so my voice sounds all raspy today, but I'm doing my best, so bear with me also. Okay, so when it comes to shooting dark and moody, there's a handful of things you need to know. Uh, I'm going to give you four tips. Well, I'm going to give you three, but I'm going to let you in a secret. There is a surprise bonus fourth one if you wait till the end, and that is going to speed up everything you do like 3,000%. So don't check out early. Okay, number one, I'm going to tell you what equipment you need. Number two, I'm going to tell you where to put the equipment. Number three, I'm going to tell you how that affects your posing. And then number four, you get to wait for. So number one, what equipment do you actually need? You need lights. Because you're not going to do this with natural light. The only way you can do it with natural light is if you had uh, a room in the dark at nighttime and there was a moon outside with moonlight coming in through that window. So if you can't replicate that, probably don't plan for natural light. So you're like, flash. Okay, cool. Um, I, can, I can manage that. I can learn flash. But what modifiers do you need? Well, you need these guys. They're called grids. This is a honeycomb grid because if you look closely, which I don't think you can from there, all the little holes are honeycomb. They're hexagonal. There's no actual honey. No bees were harmed in the making of this video. But what this does is it takes the spread of light from... Do this without dropping my strobe. 55 degrees, which is this eight and a quarter, or eight and a half inch reflector, and it narrows it down into a 10 degree circle. So there's a 10 degree angle coming out from the edges of the dish, and it, it only spills 10 degrees outside all the way around in this cone. It's almost like a spotlight, basically. Uh, you could also use a snoot, which is just gonna be a little circle size beam of light that shoots out of your strobe, but I mean, unless you know, you're doing really creative stuff where you like want to put a circle of light on one eye and have the rest black. Not a lot you can do with a snoot in boudoir, but this little guy is great. I use them for rim lights, for hair lights, for background lights, because I can aim one at the wall directly behind me. I don't know if you'll be able to see it if I actually turn on the modeling lamp. Let's try. Yeah, you can see that. So I could put this on the light direct or on the wall directly behind me. And now I have just a bright spot 
on the background that will create separation from my head to the background. You're like, I can already tell where your head stops and where the background stops. Yeah, because there's tons of light in here. But imagine your client has brown hair because most of your clients probably don't have my haircut and you're shooting in a dark background and with no lights on, brown or black hair, totally gonna disappear into the darkness. So this will allow me to put light on my head or on a body part without lighting the whole rest of the scene. Uh, then I have another honeycomb grid that's 30 degrees. So it's this, but it lights a little bit farther. So it's basically from there and then it, you know, the closer you get to things, obviously the tighter your circle will be. The farther away you get, uh, the larger the circle of light will be. And that's because it comes out in a cone shape, right? And at the end of a cone, there's a little point, and then the other end of the cone, it goes on forever. And the farther away you get, the larger the cone opening is. That's how these lights work. So you can control that circle of light by moving your light closer and farther away. Bonus tip number four is going to tell you how to do that effectively. All right, so grids are gonna be your best friend here. I'm just trying to turn this guy off. You don't need to just use these reflectors. I'm gonna tell you where the magic actually happens. Doodly doo. I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Strip Box. So this is a soft box and it has a grid on the front, just like that light that you just saw. The grid is removable. And you can just have it a regular old soft box or you can put the grid in there and control your spill of light. So what's great about these, it gives you a rectangular shaped beam of light, which happens to be about the size of a person uh, where you can just light the parts of them you want. And what's cool, this will light the part of the person you want, nothing else in the room. That's how we get dark and moody. So when I expose my camera settings or expose my my image for the room. I'm going to, I always shoot at f1.8, but I get my ISO as low as it'll go. And my shutter speed, I don't know, I try to keep it around 200 because I want to reduce the ambient light as much as possible. I want the room to basically be totally black and the only light that exposes in my image comes from my flashes. So that's how we get dark and moody. I've done shoots like this in the middle of a field in daytime here is the scene, and here is the photo. The only difference is that one was taken on my cell phone so you could see the scene where it was exposed for the daylight, and the other one, I ridiculously underexposed it so it looked like nighttime, but it's the same setup. You can see the same brick wall, uh, same person there, that is the same scene. So you can do this literally anywhere, and that's the magic of it. So for the first couple of years, this is what I used to as my main light on my subjects, and I'll tell you in a second where I put it. But it's very narrow. And while yes, it allowed me to just like carve out curves and, and shapes and my clients loved all of that, it didn't give me quite the flexibility I wanted. I needed more coverage with the light. So I recently switched to another softbox that is like 30 by 45 inches, so about the same height, but it's, you know, two to three times as wide. Still has the grid on it. So now I can still light the whole person and uh, everything on them is lit. You know, that one side that I want to be lit and everything else in the room can still go dark. There is a little spill from the bigger one because I am spreading the light out more. But if I decide it's too much, I can always grab this guy because it's ready to go here in my studio as well. You can also put one grid on one side, one grid on the other side, and just get highlights down the person, uh, rim lights down their, their back, and leave everything else. And then you're just like creating silhouettes and sexy shapes, and it's a pretty cool thing to play with. So now that you've seen the equipment that I use, because any camera, any lens, like doesn't matter. It's all about the light modifiers, and it's underexposing the room, so the only light shows up in the frame comes out of your flash. Uh, now I'm gonna show you how to approach or where to actually put the light. Now, I'm gonna oversimplify this, but if I just turn this 90 degrees, this is basically how I light my subjects. Well, hold up. Just leveled it off. Yeah, that's, that's mostly it, right here. 
So to do the dark and moody look, I get the softbox as close to my subject as I can without it being in the frame, or at least where I can edit it out of the frame later on. And I just get it 90 degrees from the camera. Not necessarily 90 degrees from the person's front, because I can turn my subject any way that I want. I want the light 90 degrees from the camera. And if I'm gonna add the background light to highlight one of my sides, this is my main light. So I'm gonna put this over the other shoulder to create separation on the right side if I want to do that. Usually I'm just using the one light. Uh, the times I do add a second light in, you know, if they're sitting on the edge of the bed or if I have a dark scene directly behind them, which I mean, it's always dark, but if there's like no light bouncing off, because those curtains, they don't really reflect anything. I'll aim this at the background, you know, a couple stops lower in intensity than this guy. So you can just see that there is a wall back there without lighting up the whole room. So that's the most common way that I use this particular light is just so that you can see there is a wall or something behind the subject. Or one of my favorite things to do is I'll light my subject with this and I'll put a pair of heels, like if they bring Louboutins or something, some fancy shoes in, I'll put them on the ground in front of my subject, underexpose my subject, and I'll light the heels and do like a close-up macro shot with just like sexy blurred silhouette in the background. Uh, here's an example of that. So these, this, this is it, I know. You're like, I thought it was gonna be harder than that. Well, we're just getting started. Posing. Everything you know about posing is now wrong. Sort of, not sort of. Because the light is only coming in from here, you have to make sure that whatever pose you're doing is not interfering with the light. So if normally you're like, ah, that's great, except now this hand is blocking this light and you're gonna lose the bottom half of their face. Or it'll leave like hand streaked shadows bleh, across their face and they'll look like a zebra and most people don't wanna look like a zebra. If they do, just go like this. Zebra effect achieved. So you gotta be mindful of that. Also, you have somebody's arms down by their side. Now their arm is lit, their side is not lit. You gotta move the arms back or move the arms forward so the arm and the side is also lit. You're like, yeah, but that's not a sexy pose, but that can be. So before you might've just done like this kind of pose, but now you gotta bring that hand farther back than you normally would have in order to get that separation in there. So you're gonna to have to make a lot of tweaks to your posing in order to make it look good on your client. Uh, also short lighting versus broad lighting. If the light's coming from here and I'm turned this way, it's going to light the broad side of my face and make my head look bigger, my face look bigger. If I turn this way and I'm lighting my subject from here, you're only gonna see the highlight over here, which makes my face look smaller. Lots of people like that. Now, what if I have hair? But what happens if your client has hair? Now their hair is blocking the light on their face. So you have to position them in a way where the light can hit their face and the camera can also see that and it's at a flattering angle. So you could be like, pull back the hair like this. That's a pretty sexy pose, right? You could totally do something like that, but you can't just go straight on because the hair is gonna be totally overexposed because it's blonde and you can't see the face at all. You're like, Mike, all you're doing is giving me problems. You're not telling me how to make this better. So now you know what equipment you need. You know where it needs to go. Excuse me. And you've re evaluated everything that you've ever known about posing. My bonus tip, tip number four, pretend each of these are a half and that they add up to four. Schedule as many gosh darn practice shoots as you can. Like call every burlesque troupe, every dance school, every pole studio, every, every possible way that you can get someone in front of your camera and just practice. It's that easy. It's that simple. Okay, so, in the beginning, I told you this is one of my biggest differentiators and why no one in my area does this is because it's hard. It's really hard to learn. But once you get the hang of it and you understand the fundamentals of all of it, it's a freaking 
game changer. Provided you like the dark and moody look, but there's a big learning curve. You know, in a light and airy shoot, when there's just sunlight everywhere, your clients like turn in every direction, putting all their limbs and everything everywhere and everything works. It does not work in dark and moody. Everything is deliberate. Everything has a purpose. So that's how I came up with my book for my flow posing because I pose differently than other photographers do. I can't just have you go like this and do all these Vogue fashion poses and stuff because it won't light you properly. So my book works really well for any kind of lighting style that you want to do. And that's why I made it the way that I did. They're poses I use in my own shoots, dark and moody, but the examples in the book, I lit everything in the room so you can see the whole scene. They look great in a light and airy setup also. So if you want to pick up a copy of that, I got a link down below. It's on the Boudoir Guild website. Uh, it is my own posing book. And again, it's going to be different from any other book you've got because it will work with any lighting style. So something to keep in mind. Also, I walk you through step-by-step step exactly how to do all those poses. I got another killer video on this channel. I'll link to that down below. 10 boudoir poses to help get you started. And you can watch me and Amy, the model in the book, actually go through. We just like rando picked pages like, cool, let's do this pose. And I read the description from the book. She does the thing and I show you how I shoot it. And it's pretty, it's pretty great if I don't say so myself. So there you go. Uh, again, if you want to know more about lighting, posing, about all this stuff, I walk you step by step through all of it at theboudoirguild.com. And I got other killer videos on this channel. So be sure to subscribe as well. You know, that might be one more bonus tip. I hear it gets easier learning this lighting setup if you're subscribed to my channel. So click the button down below and instantly get better at lighting. Instantly get better in lighting. I don't want to make any promises here, but... I heard a rumor that it's true. So there you go. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comments. You are amazing. See you inside.